But, you know, we're going to have something much better, which is <laughs> Sven Hirsch, our uh, postdoc here, uh, talking about uh, Hawking mass monotonicity and um, initial data sets. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Camilla, and thanks for giving me the introduction to speak here. And basically what I'm going to do today, I'm first going to talk a little bit about physics and then use this to motivate like some interesting system of PDEs and get some applications. All right, so let's get started. <laughs> So general relativity, which is probably also now currently discussed in Einstein's office with Christopher Nolan. <laughs> um, so basically, it can all be summarized that matter curves space time, and then the curvature of space time then determines how matter moves. And this all has a mathematical formulation. And so for this, you take a four manifold M bar P bar, which is a Sorensian. That means you have the metric has a signature with um, three <laughs> and one negative eigenvalue, which corresponds to three spatial and one time like directions. And then it also satisfies the Einstein equations, which is the Ricci curvature minus one half times scalar curvature is equal to eight pi times the stretch energy tensor. And basically, all the geometry is encoded on this side, and all the matter and physics encoded on this side. Basically, the saying like geometry is equal to physics. So basically, that's why studying these geometric problems gives a lot of physical insight. Let's do some examples. So we have the Minkowski space time. And in this case, the manifold M is just equal to a four. And um, G bar is just equal to minus dt squared plus the x squared, plus the y squared, plus the z squared. So basically, you just have this additional minus sign in the law of Pythagoras. Then there's yeah, Schwarzschild. There's been discovered just one year after the production of G Albert Einstein. And in this case, the metric takes the form of minus 1 minus 2m of r dt squared plus 1 minus 2m over our inverse the r squared plus r squared times the rod metric on this two. And basically, this over here is to describe some, this metric describes some isolated gravitational system, uh, like stars, galaxies, but also black holes, and this parameter m is just a number that corresponds to the actual mass. All right, and one thing which is Pretty interesting about the solution is that here, if you look what happens to R, if say R is equal to zero, some like interesting business is happening. And you can actually compute that also the curve just blowing up and that you have a singularity. And initially people thought that, um, okay, maybe you just have some spherical symmetry and that's why you have this weird behavior. But in general, um, you would never expect these singularities um, to occur. But then Penrose, um, show that actually they exist very generically, which is the famous Penrose Singularity Theorem, which has also been awarded the Nobel Prize. And can be roughly stated that um, some minimal surfaces uh, give rise to singularities. And in particular, since there are many uh, minimal surfaces, we also should expect many singularities and also black holes. That's also when like the physicists took like the idea of black holes more seriously and started looking for them and actually found them as well. Um, but yeah, it's still like problematic having these singularities. Um, but then there's this conjecture called the cosmic censorship conjecture, which says, okay, you have the singularities, um, but at least they're like behind the even horizon of a black hole. So you don't have to worry about them too much. But it's actually a very difficult conjecture to study because you would need to know the entire space-time development of these equations. So basically, for these equations, um, you can start with a free manifold and then sort these equations forward in time. And doing this for all time is extremely difficult. Even the easiest case examples like perturbations for <laughs> uh, slices Minkowski, you already need like a 600-page book to do it. Um, but Penrosen had this really nice insight that you can relate it to a purely geometric question, which is easier to tackle.
Okay, so let me draw it for here a picture for you. So now let's start here with what I call an inch data set. So maybe here we have some black hole, also some topology, and maybe a star over here. And this is basically just a free manifold together with a symmetric two tensor. Symmetric two tensor would correspond to the second fundamental form in the space time, and it's basically given like the speed. So basically, you have like initial position and velocity, and then you can use the second order equation to solve the problem in time. Now we can try to see what happens with this initial data set. So then maybe here, this plan over here falls into the black hole. Uh, here, the star over here is coming a little bit closer. But then if you go really far in time, and according to the final state conjecture, you should settle down to something um, static or stationary, and that would be a Schwarzschild, or you can also have rotating Schwarzschild, which is called Kerr. Um, and for the, the Schwarzschild manifold, uh, it turns out that the area of the event horizon of the black hole, which I'm going to explain a bit more in a second, is in fact equal to 16 pi times the mass of the black hole. Uh, the mass is exactly the parameter like turning up in this expansion over here. And now we can try to take this inequality over here and see how we can trace this back in time. Um, so you have like your mass can be escaping towards infinity. So the mass should go in this process down. But on the other hand side, there's this area theorem of Hawking which says that the uh, is like, not zero. Just uh, it goes down. Thank you. That, uh, that the area of the black hole is going to increase. Um, so basically, more and more starts forming the black hole, therefore it gets bigger. And so if we can, what we can then conclude is then that on this initial data set, the mass must be greater or equal than the area over 65. And this is then what is called the Penrose inequality or Penrose conjecture. Okay, but I haven't really explained to you yet um, what the surface sigma is. Um, and basically, the, the idea is then, uh, or like for like a black hole to know where the area of the boundary of the black hole is, you would still need to know again the entire space and development. But now the idea is if we just take here some minimal surface sigma, which that needs to be outermost. Then we know by the Penrose singularity theorem that there has to be um, this sing singularity in the future, but this needs to be then contained in the black hole by cosmic censorship that we can use the area of this mineral surface um, to get this estimate for the mass and area. But of course, all of this, what I just explained is very heuristic, like none of the steps are like very rigorous, um, but it motivates like a purely geometric inequality. And now we can ignore like all the physics and try to analyze this inequality rigorously. So, uh, uh, so this evolution in time is what's happening. There's radiation happening. And that's why you form these simpler structures or, or not? Um, or oh, that's the final state conjecture yeah. which physicists believe is true that after like a really long time, everything will just settle down to curved black holes or okay. finger okay. or finger black holes which are rotating. So every, either everything is like rotating Radiating away or falling into a black hole. Or falling in. So there yeah. are two mechanisms for this. Uh, yeah, exactly. Simpler structure, I guess, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, but now let's try to introduce like um, all the mathematics to it and study this rigorously. Mm -hmm. And there's actually a theorem, which is the so called Riemannian Penrose inequality. And from, when I say Riemannian, I always mean the case where k equal to zero. So we have here this general initial data set. And if the second fundamental <laughs> form is not there, then things are going to be a little bit simpler. And this is due to Hilsky Ullmann and Stuart Bray. So first, Hilsky Ullmann for a single connected horizon, and then Bray for arbitrary many with two different methods. Both proofs are very beautiful. I'm going to show them to you in a second. And basically, the result is as follows. 
So we have some M and three manifold, which is asymptotically flat. So if asymptotically flat, I mean, I basically mean when you have a manifold like this, there's like all this kind of interesting stuff happening in the middle. But once you go like far out, you don't have like any more black holes or any or that much curvature. Basically, say if we are from here observing um, some black hole in the galaxy, the gravitational effects will be so small that this is a pretty good approximation. And then we assume that we have no negative scan curvature, which corresponds to um, having no negative energy density. And then we have that sigma as some outermost. Uh, minimal surface. Um, so, so let's say here's our sigma, and in particular, you don't have any. Say if here's another minimal surface sigma prime, you can't take this one. In fact, the Penrose inequality. It's easy to see that inequality is false. And so then, if this is satisfied, then the mass. The manifold is greater or equal than the area of mass six and pi with the quality if and only if um, M3G here is Schwarzschild. Okay. And basically, the mass in this case is given explicitly for Schwarzschild, but in general, I'm also going to give you later that the formula is basically just. And describing exactly how you're approaching Euclidean space at infinity. So it's basically what you get when you expand the metric over there. So just I didn't understand what you mean by outermost minimal surface. Um, that's a good question. So basically, with outermost, I don't want that there's any other minimal surface enclosing this one. So for instance, for sigma one, it's enclosed by sigma. Um, so the sigma one, sigma one would not be outermost, but sigma is not. Not is is an automorphic because there's no other minimal surface, so the inequality holds true for this sigma, but not for this one over here. And you see, you can make like here these minimal surfaces. You can make them like arbitrary large. So you basically have like yeah. no chance of proving anything for these minimal surfaces, but only for this minimal surface, which also makes kind of the proofs and uh, very interesting because they have to. Does cover these properties, which is like quite non local. So you need to use some more nonlinear equations to deal with them. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. All right. Um, so, so let me um, sketch how this is proved. And there are basically two methods how to do this. There's the conformal flow of Bayesian Bray. And basically, we need to relate this information of sigma, the outermost minimal surface, to the information of the mass, which is determined at infinity. So somehow we need to get from this black hole um, to this, from this minimal surface all the way to infinity to be able to compare them. <coughs> and in the conformal flow, it's done as follows. Let's say we have here some arbitrary manifold. And we want to somehow go from this minimal surface to infinity. The way it's done, you use some conformal transformations to basically take the infinity where the like whole hole was, and you're transforming with these conformal transformations, um, then essentially to Schwarzschild. And basically all this arbitrary manifold. It's gonna then look roughly like this. And then you can show that in this process. Uh, the area stays constant, but the mass is decreasing. And in the end, you're going to converge to something which is Schwarzschild outside this horizon over here. So then you can just similarly like in the heuristic argument, but not just you just are dealing essentially with harmonic functions. So you can actually solve it. You can then trace back this equality over here back under this flow and get in this inequality over here. Very beautiful argument. 
And then this other one, other approach is basically the opposite way. Instead of taking the infinity, bringing it to the minimal surface, you're not taking the minimal surface and bring it to infinity. And this is what is called um, inverse mean convergent law. So I have here another picture. And that's called a surface, the most normal surface is called sigma zero. Or that we have zero mean curvature because it's minimal. And then we're going to let it flow outwards towards infinity. So this is then called sigma t. And then let's zoom in a little bit more. So say we have here some of these have a sigma t, and then we're going to flow by what is called inverse mean curvature flow. So basically the speed is going to be given by the inverse of the mean curvature. So here the mean curvature is very small. So one over the mean curvature is going to be very big. Here's the mean curvature pretty large. So one of the mean curvature is going to be small. And similar here. Then you have this flow flowing outwards. And will turn out it actually converges to like a round sphere at infinity. You start nearby, I guess, right? Because sigma zero has h equals zero, so you can't. Oh, great question. So basically, one needs to come up with like a weak notion of solutions. Uh -huh. So basically, it's already been known by Giroch, Chang, and Walt that you can use this to theoretically prove the inequality, but then the trick is then. Um, how to actually solve this equation. And basically there's some uh, nice variational pr principle be yeah, behind it to come up with like a weak solution. Um, but, and, and, but basically whenever your surface is like, whenever the flow is smooth, then it will actually be flowing by one over the mean curvature. But in general, other things can happen. For instance, there can be jumps. Um, so there can be like discontinuities in, in the flow. And how can you use the fact that this is outermost? Um, because it doesn't ex exactly. So basically, if you would be here and starting at this surface, you would get stuck. At, so... Then you would immediately jump to this next the surface with the same area. Of, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, you jump. Yes. Yeah, so basically, you will always jump to the surface which is out minimizing. So it's not enclosed with any surface which has less area. Uh, and basically, that would destroy a monotonicity. Uh, that's the definition of weak solution. Does that for you? Yeah, exactly. That you can always jump. Um, and so you kind of need like this complicated PDE with like this jumping behavior to have like a chance at it. Because if you use like harmonic functions, for instance, how could a simple harmonic function determine um, whether you're like an outermost normal surface or, or whether you're like one back there? Um, so that kind of makes the problem like difficult, but also like interesting because um, you have to deal with these non similarities. May I ask you another question? So in all this discussion, the second fundamental form doesn't seem to play any role, right? I mean, that one is purely Riemannian, but there's uh, no mention of this K. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that's basically what I want to want to do in the talk. Um, so I want to propose how to do an uh, inverse mean curvature flow with a K. So okay. far. So basically, this problem over here, this Penrose inequality um, in the general form is now open for exactly um, 50 years. And for the case where k, equals not, where k is not equal to zero, it's over pretty wide open. It's actually also like appeared um, also like in like, um, like popular literature that has even been like um, a famous American sitcom where the main character claims to have solved it while um, mm -hmm. writing his Nobel Prize acceptance let speech. Um, yeah, but basically so far everything for k equals zero, and then we're going to discuss how we can space time ice. Thanks. Uh, any more questions? All right, so we have now a flow. Okay, so we have something to compare like the surface here with what's happening in infinity. But that's only like one of the ingredients. Um, we also need a monotonicity, and this will be then the monotonicity of um, the so-called Hawking mass. <laughs> so 
So the Hopkin mass of some surface sigma is just defined to be the area of sigma over 16 pi of 1 minus 1 over 16 pi integral of sigma the mean curvature squared. So it just depends on the surface and the mean curvature. For instance, in Euclidean space on round spheres, it would always be equal to zero. And then the nice property of this is that it's monotonically increasing if you have a negative scalar curvature and it approaches the mass at infinity. And now let's have to see what happens at the minimal surface when h equals zero. Then this term over here won't be here. And all that remains is this area term over there. But this is exactly what we wanted to show. So the existence theory of like this weak notion of inverse mean curvature flow together with this monotonicity formula give the proof of the Patterson equality. Um, similarly, how um, the existence theory of the conformal flow together with this monotonicity over here gives this other proof. So we always need like this two ingredients in these proofs. <laughs> One more thing I wanted to mention, we can also approximate inverse mean curvature flow via p-harmonic functions. And, um, and basically, this is like another way how you can, and then you don't actually need to solve inverse mean curvature flow, um, but you can basically just try to get monotonicity formulas for p-harmonic functions. And then these geometric inequalities for p-harmonic function and try to take a limit with this. Um, so because we're gonna use more of these harmonic and p-harmonic functions later, um, I want to remark this as well. And it's first been observed that it approaches inverse mean curvature flow by Roger Moser. And then to get the uh, Patterson equality from this, work by Gossiniani, Mendigazza, Mazzeri, Orazio, and also joint work with Peng Ximiao and Van Fai Tam. So, one question. Changing some exponents here and there, the xenonic mass, which will have some monotonicity property also with respect to p harmonic functions. Yeah, exactly. They're like monotonicity, they're like p Hawking masses, and um, and basically you get then a bond instead of the mass rate equal to um, the area, you get like the p capacity, but the p capacity for p going to one is just the square root of the area of the outermost minimal surface. So these capacities also recognize the autonomous condition nicely. All right, now let's coming back to Camilla's question. So we have now a pretty good idea of what happens in the case when k is equal to zero. But now the question is, that's also where the physical motivation comes from. What does space-time inverse mean curvature flow? In the space-time, I always mean the case where k is non-zero as opposed to remaining in inverse mean curvature flow. I, I could also ask what the space time conformal flow, but there hasn't, but that seems to be pretty specific to the remaining case, and there hasn't been much progress made in this direction. So let me quickly go through what has been done so far. So there's what is called inverse mean curvature vector flow. Um, by your form, Nina. And then there's what is called null inverse mean curvature flow, which is due to Kristen Moore and Tristan Wolf. <clears throat> then there's what is called uniformly area expanding flow. Right, Bray. Hey, what? Mars and Simon. And then what is perhaps of those for the most interesting one, so-called Jang, which I'm going to explain in a second in more detail, inverse mean curvature flow by Bray 
and Perry. Um, and basically, Jang inverse mean curvature flow is combining inverse mean curvature flow with Jang's equation. Jang's equation is something like a prescribed mean curvature equation, which has been used in the so-called positive mass theorem, which is basically just a statement that m is greater equal than zero, but having this explicit bound. And the Jang equation has there been used to go from the Riemannian case to the space-time case. So the idea is, if it works for this positive mass theorem, maybe it also works for the Penrose inequality. And basically, there you can couple the Jang equation to get a mean curvature flow to get like a new flow. But the difficulty with this is that it's a really complicated PDE. Like also, where the inverse mean curvature flow has some jumps, and the Jang equation also has some blobs. So they are already in their own right very difficult. So if you combine them, then you also have some second order coupling terms. So it gets like um, too complicated. Um, and the same is true for all these other flows. For instance, this one is backward parabolic, or you don't have more tonicity formulas. And if you want to get the Penrose inequality, the difficult thing is that we need both. You need to have something with a monotonicity formula and with some existence theory. And that seems to be the difficult part. Yeah, and then with um, Jang and mean curvature flow, one difficulty comes by adding the Jang equation to the mean curvature flow. And there are several ways to prove the space type in was as the space and positive mass theorem. But the Jang's equation is from like a PDE point of view, um, maybe the most complicated PDE you can use to prove it. Um, so maybe what if you take another proof of the space and positive mass theorem, which is using a simpler PDE, and then try to combine this with the mean curvature flow. To get a more solvable equation. So we should first look at the space and positive mass theorem and try to understand this better before we then move on to the Penrose inequality, which is the more challenging problem. So the toy problem is then the space time positive mass theorem. Or basically, it's like toy problem squared because basically the Penrose inequality is the toy problem for the cosmic censorship. So we reduced it now to the Penrose inequality, and now we go one step further to the positive mass theorem. And of course, I put in quotation mark because that's been like an open question for a while before Shane Yao and Edward Witten solved it. I still have a question about these equations. So, mm -hmm. like, when you motivate all of this, you kind of started with a cosmic censorship conjecture. Mm -hmm. You said, like, if you had this, you could prove this inequality. Of course, that's difficult because, well, cosmic mm -hmm. censorship is difficult. Are there any other hyperbolic equations that you could maybe use to prove this? Right. So, you kind of explained if you had it for the Einstein equation, you could prove the inequality, but that would be difficult. But are there simpler hyperbolic equations? Um, I believe that's not known. The only uh, one I'm aware of is when you use like the Einstein equations, which are of course quite difficult to solve. Um, okay. And basically, like these equations, we also have something like a convergence to Schwarzschild is like nice because basically there you solve the minimal surface equation together with some harmonic equations. Okay. But, but so this and like all of these, they're all like parabolic or backward parabolic or something like this. So some of this is like hyperbolic, right? So like, uh, yeah, the, the, yeah, the yeah exactly. It's all like more like of like a flow nature. So it, it has like some parabolicity to it. Sometimes it can be maybe backward parabolic. Maybe you have something, some non local terms or some third order. But in the end, in if you like restrict to the k equals zero case, they would all recover it was mean curvature flow, which um, which is parabolic if you don't have these issues with jumps and zero mean curvature. Otherwise, you can think of it as a degenerate elliptic system. Okay, so let's go to the setup. Um, so we're going to have a look at these initial data sets. Maybe you have some topology over here. And maybe as some galaxy over there.
And then to this initial data set, you can associate an energy density and momentum density, which basically generalizes the scalar curvature over here. So let me recall the definitions. So the energy density is called mu and is one half times scalar curvature plus trace k squared minus norm k squared. And then there's the momentum density. Which is J by the divergence of K minus trace K G. And then usually you assume that mu is greater or equal than norm J. And if K is equal to zero, this is exactly the same as saying like scale curvature. So basically you now have the same as before, you just have a little bit more algebra to deal with. But otherwise it's it's the same. And then before I was mentioning that the mass you can evaluate at infinity. Um, so let me give you their uh, exact formula as well. So in fact, we have the energy, which is one over 16 pi, the integral of at infinity. Basically with this as infinity, I just mean take a sphere of radius r and then take a limit as r is going to infinity. And you can prove that this can be all done rigorously. And then in coordinates, but it's called an independent. Then you take like these derivatives of the metric with the normal vector, this gives you energy, and similarly the momentum is a vector given by one over eight pi. The integral of the scale infinity of k j minus trace k. <laughs> and then the mass is just the Lorentz length of that, so that would be the square root of e squared minus p squared. And then there's this positive mass theorem um, by Chagnon. <coughs> and okay, have a written. And this basically just says that you have some initial data set, M3GK, which is asymptotically flat. That also ensures that these quantities over here are well defined and um, nothing bad, bad is happening. So basically, when you have a G is approaching the Euclidean metric, but and that the K has to approach a zero, and there's some precise rates that this has to occur. So if this is satisfied, then you assume that mu is greater equal to norm J, which corresponds to non negative scalar curvature. And then it follows that E is greater equal to norm P. Moreover, with equality, if and only if um, MGK is contained in Minkowski space, meaning that it isometrically embeds and has a complement from K, or um, it's from like um, upcoming work of your Jane. Um, that you would be inside a flat, uh, so called flat planar wave space time. Um, so, this basically can occur in like higher dimensions. Um, I'm, I'm a bit confused. This or means that the two conditions are equivalent, or that it well, basically, Minkowski's, that's the question. Basically, Minkowski space is a special case of these uh, flat planar um, wave space times. So, so, you, so the first, if without the or part, the statement would be false. Uh, yeah, there are kind of examples in, okay. in the, high the dimensions. If the decay is not, if the decay is slow. Yeah, exactly. So, so, so in general, you can get these both cases and. On this case, if you assume this extra decay, there are some very nice papers by um, Big Push or Push to Martin and Huang Yi. Um, okay. Okay, then let's go to another um, theorem. Um, so instead, so it's written used like like the Lichnerovich formula for the Dirac equation, or more like a space time version of the Dirac equation. And Chenyo, as mentioned before, used the uh, um, Chang's equation, 
And then there's also a proof with marginally auto trap surfaces, which are like normal surface generalizations. I am going to be in check. And then it's a recent paper by together with Dimitri Kazaras and Marcus Curry. And we showed that E plus P in X direction is greatly equal than 1 over 16 pi. The integral of uh, the manifold, you have to be a bit careful, you have to chop away a little bit topology, let's, so I'm calling it exterior region. And then some quantity depending on a function I'm explaining in a second. So the Hessian of u plus k times some gradient of u squared divided by non gradient u plus two times mu not gradient u plus two j get product gradient u. And this function u, so also PDE. So the Laplace of u is equal to minus grace k non gradient of u and u to x at infinity. Okay, so let me make a few comments to this. So first of all, this x is of course completely arbitrary, so for instance, you can also take here y, then you get the momentum here in y direction, etc. Then if the dominant energy condition holds, then this whole <laughs> integral over here will be non-negative. So you get in particular the positive mass theorem. Sorry, what is x? Um, in the asymptotic leaf flight and uh, coordinate direction. Um, but basically, the main, main point I want to make here is uh, the underlying PE. Because before you had like some prescribed um, mean curvature equation. One question. Right? So you're assuming that there is, I, I should, it should be obvious to me that P has a sign. P, you are assuming that P has uh, a sign. A P, a P, P is, uh, a P, P, P is a vector, and basically then you can plug in into like, can, can plug in these different directions. So if you then plug in, um, x to be in the direct, or ah, the x to be in the direction of p, then you can make the left hand side to be exactly e minus one p. Very okay. good question. And any others? All right. So the point point of um, point of this now, in the context of the Penrose inequality, is that if you want to come up have like any PDE with which somehow encodes the second fundamental form k, and um, then this is one of the e easiest you can write down. It's 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 maybe nonlinear, but it has only a very mild nonlinearity. And moreover, it's homogeneous. You can still apply the maximum principle. So it's actually, from a PDE point of view, pretty nice. You can solve it very easily. Direct uh, some fixed point methods direct in compact domains, and also easily pass to limit at infinity. So the solvability of this equation is not very problematic. And then the question is, what happens if you then combine this equation uh, with inverse mean curvature flow and try to come up with like a more solvable, solvable method, a more inverse mean curvature flow in the space setting, which is easier to solve? Um, but why this equation in particular? It seems kind of like a little bit random. Um, why, why in particular this PDE? And this is what we call a space and harmonic function. <laughs> and basically, the motivation comes from looking at Minkowski space. But this is something that you solve on the minor manifold, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, you call it space time harmonic function. But it's essentially three dimensional. But it's actually three dimensional. Yes. Okay, good. Basically, whenever I use the space time, it's to indicate the k, but it's yeah, that's the, the real yeah, yeah. lines, and but it can cause confusion. Okay. Um, but basically, what we're doing now is now just pretend we are in a space time in a Lorentzian manifold, and then what's the nice equation there, the Laplace equation, um, or wave operation in the Lorentzian setting, and then try to restrict it on the initial data set and see what for an equation you get, and that's precisely this equation. So, uh, uh, let, let, let me write it up now. So given some initial data set over here, so this is also by the way the x, y, and z coordinate. So we have now m3g uh, contained in Minkowski space. And in Minkowski space, what would be some example of uh, 
function, um, which is harmonic that, for instance, cluster X function U equal to X plus T. And let's, let's see what equation satisfies on the slice over here. So first observe that, in fact, the Hessian is vanishing. So if you take the Minkowski Hessian of U, then for all components, this will be zero. And now we can also take the trace of this respect to the metric G with respect to the three-dimensional one. And then what you get is uh, the Laplace, but now on the three-dimensional manifold of U, <laughs> and then plus trace K times the normal derivative of U, where this is here, the space-time normal over here. Um, but this is not actually a little bit um, problematic if you want to describe this as an equation because this n, this norm, normal, that depends on the space-time structure, not on just the initial data set structure. But now the nice case with maybe what looked arbitrary choosing the u equal to x plus t is that is a null function. And so we can actually replace this with plus trace k normal the gradient of u. And this will also have like another interpretation coming from spin geometry, which I'm gonna mention a little bit later. And also this formula over here is due to, uses like a bottom formula on level sets due to the term. And also like interestingly, like these level sets in this case, it's called a maybe sigma, which they are in, in the proof. They will be basically just these intersections of these now planes and all and will be completely flat. So, so this thing, uh, the first thing you, so zero equals and so those indices, they're just, they're, they're tangent to? Uh, yeah, exactly. So they're, they're just going from one to three, not from one to four. So I'm tracing here with metric G of M, not of the metric G bar of Minkowski space. Otherwise you would get, an, otherwise when you do this Laplace decomposition, you would get the yes. normal, you would otherwise get like an up and then bar right. And it's the ambient connection that you use. Uh, yeah, this is the am ambient yep. connection of Minkowski yep. space. And then you do the decomposition of um, ambient Laplace operator equal to a hypersurface Laplace operator plus the mean curvature right, term right. Yeah. plus. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So do you always get this if you take an optical function in a general space time, or is there something about Minkowski space? Um, I mean, Minkowski space is the. Nice, nice thing that you have that the complete hessian is vanishing, like this step over here. Mm -hmm. So it's so basically say, I mean, this works in dimension three, and then you don't have these planar waves. Um, so on this, so basically, you we went like we're looking. Okay, what happens in the case of equality? That these functions have to be exactly have this form, and then see what kind of equations they satisfy, and then try to trace it back. Yeah. Get this integral form over here. Any more questions? I guess that you you may say it later, but that equation that you wrote seems to be very hard to solve. Maybe maybe it's not. But uh, this one? Yeah. Like finding such u. Um, it's actually actually um not 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 too bad because well, like the problem is like this nonlinearity. But it's like pretty mild. It's not if it would be like gradient u squared or so, it would be much more complicated. Um, but basically, because of this, you can um, just use like method of continuity or fixed point methods. Um, and if, say, if you, for instance, want, then you need to use the estimates for solution, then you see, for instance, um, I that, guess that you got can... nice estimates from elliptic theory directly. So the point is that you, first you restrict on a large wall, you solve it there setting as boundary condition exactly equal to x and then you say that you have nice estimates or you're actually able to solve it directly on the whole space great question we're doing it like on like a ball um but that one has to be a little bit tricky if you solve like if you um yeah make it use this blackboard so what one would like to do is laplace equal to minus trace k from gradient u on br with u equal to x on the boundary and then take like a limit. But actually when you do this, then you need to, that doesn't quite work. You need to be there a little bit tricky. So what we need to do is we have to set it equal to V and here Laplace V is equal to like gradient U is expected to be roughly one infinity 
So V is like a little bit of like a linear version of this equation, which is just minus trace k without a long gradient V. And then you solve this on the entire manifold and V to X um, at infinity. I, I, you could also do it directly with X, but then you need to assume like beta decay for trace K. And, um, so it would still work, but you'd get like a um, not not as nice result. So you need to be a bit careful with the boundary data. Thank you. Okay. Um, so there's actually already been like a proof of the Romanian positive mass theorem before all this. Our paper and we are basically um, was done by Brake, Lazarus, Kerr, and Stern, where they proved the Romanian positive mass theorem with harmonic functions. So basically, what we have done here is like to space timeize these harmonic functions, these like space harmonic functions, and get proved. So now it's the question can we space timeize also Green's functions um, or P harmonic functions, and then eventually space timeize the Nusselt curvature flock? And that comes, and that's going to be actually a very surprising answer. I'm going to start with the space time means function of like basically this harmonic function of radially symmetric. And then, like what Moser did going like from harmonic, P harmonic to this curvature flaw. <laughs> and the reason I'm doing it for harmonic is it's going to be a, for this means function, it's going to be essentially exactly the same to do it as for this curvature flaw, but it's going to be technically nicer with less algebraic terms. And there's been a very nice typo by Agostiniani. Mazzieri and Lorenzo, and they showed the Remanian um, positive mass theorem via uh, these Green's functions. Yeah, the solutions of Laplace do equal to two non gradient u squared over u. Now that this is just equivalent, basically saying that Laplace of one over u is equal to zero. And why do I write it in this way? Um, it's sort of like for this application towards mass, more natural, like say in Euclidean space, u would be just r instead of 1 over r, so gradient of r is equal to 1. And basically, you always want the gradient of this function to be equal to 1 at infinity, which um, um, allows you then to easier pick up the mass term at infinity, and it also would correspond like to a to static potential. Um, but, anyways, so there's this very nice paper which proves the random PMT with solutions to this equation and how can you space time this? And the answer how to space time this will be then exactly the same how to space time the Nussmann curvature flaw. So the first naive try we could do is following. So for here, if we were just doing the following. We had a harmonic function and then we're adding this little trace k term and then everything worked out. So let's try to do exactly the same here. So let's do and plus u equal to minus trace k on gradient u plus um, uh, trace k on gradient u plus two non gradient u squared over u. So the same as before, but we added this term. But then if you try to compute like this monotonicity formula, there's like what was mentioned before, there's like also like a Hawking mass type for these harmonic functions, which they found in their paper. But then you get bad cross terms. <laughs> which look like this. They look like gradient u squared over u times trace k. And then you, maybe you say, okay, maybe we have here the wrong sign. Maybe we, because before we are doing a minus, maybe we actually want to do that plus v equal to minus trace k non gradient v plus two non gradient v squared over v. And then uh, you can get bad cross terms, maybe not very surprisingly, but with minus non gradient v squared over v trace k. Did you assume the trace k has a sign? Do you get something now? Uh, yeah, then you would, would get, get something, but um, but basically nothing like very interesting. But basically, like here, these terms now, they have almost exactly the same form. So if you could just add these two equations, then we have here like a term with plus trace k and here one with minus trace k, and then they cancel. But none of the monotonicities work if you assume uh, a sign on trace k, like in any of these proofs. Like in any of the flows that don't have monotonicity, you can't get it by 
Can you get it by assuming something about trace care? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, just one thing. Uh, what you're writing now is equivalent to applying this, like, because you decided to apply the transformation to the first equation you wrote, so Laplace and U equal to 2, blah, blah, blah. You could do the same also to Laplace of 1 over U equal to 0, which, like, I mean, that's 3 general. Mm -hmm. You could, 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 could also try the same. It also doesn't work. Um, oh, but it, it's not equivalent. Or, um, it's, it's not equivalent, yeah. But, but that's a good question. So basically, um, if you, you, for, you always want the gradient to be asymptotic to one. Like Also, like if you do, for instance, the Hawking mass monotonicity formula, or like also like, or like here the formula, instead of writing it down in harmonic function, if you write it down in terms of this one over you, everything gets much simpler and nicer. Um, okay, but okay. So if you just try these two things out, you see you get these like bad cross terms coming between those those two terms. And when you try to compute the monotonicity, it doesn't quite work. But I mean, if you like see where we got this, we didn't just got it like randomly by trying to plug in some terms, but we got it by like looking at what happens to these slices in Minkowski space. And there we figured out that for these slices, all of them satisfy this nice equation. So maybe we should try this next. So let's call the second try. Um, so I'll take again some initial data set in Minkowski. And now, if you want to have a radial function, maybe the natural thing to try would be u equal to r plus t. But then if you want to come up with an equation, it turns out that Laplace u does not depend on just k and u as before. So there is not like one equation which is true for all of these subsets of Minkowski space. And similarly, if you try this other function, v equal to r minus t, by the way, for this one, these level sets that correspond to these null counts, or the other one, to these null counts. So if you try this other null function, v equal to r minus t, then Laplace v does not just depend on g, k, and v. But now the interesting part comes that Laplace u does depend on g, k, u, and v, and Laplace V does depend on G, K, V, and U. Okay, so if you do two functions, then suddenly you can find some equations that are true for all slices in Minkowski space. And then we have two functions. We can actually have like two monotonicity formulas, which give us a lot of bad terms, and just add them together. So we can take the monotonicity formula for this one and for this one. We get these bad cross terms, but you see they have the opposite signs and they cancel. Um, so we are able to um, actually do get a monotonicity formula, but you need two functions to do it. And also to recognize the slices, you need two functions to do it. <laughs> Just one thing that might show that I'm missing something huge. There are two terms on the opposite side, but they're also different functions. So like, it's not that you sum them and they cancel each other. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you have to couple it like a nice, but that's a very good point. But basically, you want to sneak into these PDEs like some coupling terms to precisely make them to be exactly the same, I see. but with opposite sign. Or in the end, you don't just get one term, you get like a line or two lines of terms, but they all cancel like. <laughs> okay, so let me write down the system for these greens functions. So here, let me start as before. So Laplace u equal to minus trace k non-gradient u and Laplace v equal to now plus trace k non-gradient v. But now if I adjust to this, it's like not coupled. So basically we're introducing some mild coupling into them. So that would be now plus v non-gradient u, non-gradient v plus the other product gradient u gradient v divided by u plus v. And similar here, exactly the same to be precise. Okay. Um, okay, so basically that looks now a little bit wild, 
But the surprising thing for this is you actually get both a monotonicity and you get a general existence result for this PDE. So let me add to this a few more details. So first of all, it's motivated here from the slice Minkowski space. And in fact, for any slice, if you take R plus T and R minus T, for any slice, they will always satisfy these equations. And let's call this PDE star. And they solve it for R MGK in Minkowski space. Then in the special case when k is equal to zero, um, then we can in fact say that then this term is not here. And then the equation for u and v will be exactly the same. So say if you have the same boundary conditions, then you can in fact choose then u equal to v and you recover uh, the Green's function equation from before. So basically this PDE is just some generalization of this one. It's like a space-time version of this PDE. Then you in fact recover the monotonicity formulas um, from uh, from these screens functions over here. So that would be just in the case k equals zero. And from the space-time positive mass theorem over here, which would correspond to um, v equal to zero. Um, then what you also get is some um, general existence results. So what, what do I mean precisely with this, given any um, um, compact manifold, say, to, say take an analyst, you can prescribe some directly boundary data, or make it positive directly boundary data such that you don't have parental troubles with dividing by zero, then you can find C to alpha solutions for U and V. Basically, um, a priori you run into difficulties because you have these quadratic terms over here, which is just not good enough to do some bootstrapping with elliptic estimates, but if you define W equal to U minus V and H equal to one over U plus V, then it turns out for this system, you have some better, the PDEs look a little bit better. You have done one where you have like still quadratic terms, but for the difference it cancels. So then you can use elliptic estimates and plug them back to each other. So then you get good enough estimates to then use them um, from nonlinear functional analysis. Okay, and then finally, I also want to mention that it appears to be related to spin geometry. So recall if you have some SL2C spinner, um, it gives you always rise to uh, a null vector field. But the ones you often use, they are so-called Dirac spinners or two component spinners. So they actually give you two null vector fields. And similar like here, you have like two, in the case, at least in this Minkowski space, two null functions. And then finally, um, this idea of using two functions, you can also get monotonicity formulas in other contexts where it was not able to get one with just a single function, for instance, for like this based on positive mass theorem with charge, where with one function, it does not work, but with two functions, which looks very similar to this, it does work. Um, are there any questions? Yeah, so what do you need then to prove the Penrose inequality? Uh, that's a good question. So this is so far just for harmonic. I'm down to, now I'm writing down the system for inverse mean curvature flow, and there's also one for p-harmonic, but I currently don't have an existence theory for um, the case where p is not, well, like for p-harmonic where p is not equal to two. Okay, okay. Um, it's already, how much time do I have to like? Yeah. This looks tired. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, oh, we can give another five minutes. Okay, let me finish by. Also, I, I hope that we have today some extra good teas, or not that we're running out of all the good cookies and <laughs> okay. cake. <laughs> okay, so basically, um, so let, 
let me write down this inverse mean curvature flow equation and then uh, finish. Um, so basically, so for space minus mean curvature flow, um, so you can basically, it's basically like doing null inverse mean curvature flow, which I'm explaining in a second, and then introducing again some out coupling. So null inverse mean curvature flow would be flowing by theta plus, which you can write as theta plus on gradient u equal to two non gradient u squared over u, where theta plus or minus is just equal to the mean curvature plus minus the trace of the level set um, of k. So you're looking, at, you're looking at the mean curvature flow in the level set formulation, that's what you're doing? Um, yeah, yeah, basically this is like the null and exactly this like null and mean curvature flow studied by Kristen Moore and she was studying flows with like the speed one over theta plus and also one over theta minus, which would be satisfying this equation. And the problem with like these null and mean curvature flow was that you didn't have a monotonicity formula. You always got some bad cross terms between this term and these k terms in these null and mean curvature flows. Um, but I think my question is more basic, right? So, I mean, like my mean curvature Oh, yeah, that would be is, like the level set formula. Like the level sets, right? Yeah, exactly. The level so basically, sets of you is the evolution of your sigma. Exactly. So, so mean curvature flow in this language would be just that h on gradient u equals to non gradient u squared or u. I also, it's basically like a rescaling of the one you find in Husky Ilman's paper. Um, just makes like some of the formulas a little bit easier. And, and so basically, this is these non mean curvature flaws, and then you get these cross terms. But then, what we're going to do, we're going to get rid of these terms, and instead, we're going to do um, this couple term. It's similar as before, a little bit different. And for this, then you get like a monotonicity. Okay, that's everything I want to say. Uh, thanks very much, and I'm not longer keeping you off all the cookies. <laughs>